What do you remember from the video? Let's start with Lara, then Brittany, then Cassie. Um, I think they basically thought that the person that committed the crime was some sort of artist. Mm -hmm. So they tried to profile him. So when he, um, I think he had sexually assaulted the woman that was on the floor. When he, um, when he did so, he took her earrings out and placed it like symmetrically on mm. the, um, the side of her left ear and the side of her right. And then there were like bite marks in the inner side of her thigh. And mm. it quite looked artistic the way he. But he did it so they mm. thought as a character, as a characteristic of his, he'd be an artist. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, they, when they were just when they were only looking at the evidence that was there, mm -hmm. they thought that uh, the person that assaulted her was black mm -hmm. because of the pubic hair. But then after they assessed the scene and used it, they figured out who the right person was mm -hmm. because there's details in the crime. Exactly. Cassie. Yeah, I guess you say that, but. Yeah, they thought it was a black man, but then they used something else because normally, like, the victim is the same race. So then they were like, oh, okay, it's a white man. Yeah. And then they, there was some guy in a mental hospital because mm -hmm. he wasn't, yeah, it was him. Alright. Approaches involve crime scene analysis. That is the first thing that happens. So I'm going to put crime scene analysis. The difference now, the difference between the top down and the bottom up approach is whether we start off with the profiler themselves, so the person who's actually profiling the individual, or we go by data first. And this will make more sense. So we have the profiler, which is you guys. And then we have actual data. The top-down approach says that after doing the crime scene analysis, you go from the profiler to the data. Meaning that the immediate instincts of the profiler, the immediate intuition of the profiler is what they go by. And then they try and match it against the data. Yeah, so top-down goes from profiler to the data. The intuition of the profiler, the opinions, the, the expertise of the profiler, match it to the data. Then what is bottom up? Data to profiler. So we have an arrow. Now we're going to go on to the six stages. So in your in your points, make down point number one. Profiling inputs. And these are the stages that we follow with the top down process. So, in profiling inputs, we actually look at the background information of the victim. What are they like? What is their routine? Do they walk the dog at a particular time in the day? Do they go to the gym? What relationships do they have? What are their general habits? So you're looking at background information about the victim. And then we go on to the details of the crime itself. Was there a weapon used? If so, what type of weapon? Were they shot? Were they stabbed? And if a weapon wasn't used, what was used to kill them? How did they die? Are they both in stage one? Yeah, they're all in stage oh. one. So the reason it's called profiling input is there's loads of information being put into that initial profile. So hopefully the word inputs would trigger you guys to remember that we're looking at background information about the victim and details of the crime itself. <laughs> so in the video that we watched, the lady wasn't killed using uh, like an orthodox weapon. She was killed using the bag that she used to pack her makeup and, and everything. So the strap that was used to strangle her. So someone profiling would take that into account. And then we've got description of the crime scene itself. So where is it located? What was found at the crime scene? Is it round the corner from the gym that she works at or attend. So that 
is profiling in the church. Stage two, which is something that we call the decision process models. And in this stage, I've summarized it in a sentence, and that's what I want you guys to do for all the other stages, except for stage three, which we're going to go into a bit more detail. We organize the data that we gathered from the profile inputs into meaningful patterns. So if she was killed round the corner from her gym, could it be that she had just finished a session, so we know her general working pattern, we know her habits, we know her routine, we've now linked it to the location of the crime scene. So this particular stage organizes all the information we've gathered into meaningful patterns. We start to make a link. Stage three, we've got something called crime assessment. And there's two stages that are called crime assessment, but this one is with reference to the offender. And we have the category of organized versus disorganized offender. Organized versus disorganized offender. Okay. So this stage we've got the organized and disorganized offender. How do we actually differentiate between the two? I'm going to give you guys one between two. Some of you may have one each. Once I go around. I'm giving you different characteristics of offenders. And I need you to decide whether you think this, this characteristic matches someone who would be deemed organized or disorganized. Once you have determined once you have determined whether they are organized or disorganized, I need you to come collect Ruta and stick it up on which one you think it is. Yeah? This is your time to shine in terms of this Sexual acts post 
post-mortem. What do we mean by post-mortem? After death. Tends to be disorganized. Um, so minimal use of restraints. So you don't strap them up, you don't bind them, you're kind of free with them. Bind them when when they're dead. No, when they're alive. So if you restrain someone, you prevent them from moving, you prevent them from doing their regular activities. So minimal use of restraints leaves the body on display and performs sexual acts post mortem. Oh. Organized or disorganized? Disorganized. Say that again. Even though organized person. Even an organized person or organized defender can have sex with the dead body. Dead body. I say we put it in the middle. You guys have done well to be honest. Let me show you the actual the actual breakdown. So organized person, definitely average to high intelligence. Socially competent, plans offences, uses restraints on victims, weapon is usually hidden, body is transported from the scene. Victim is specifically targeted apparently, and they try to conceal the evidence. Whereas the disorganised offender, below average intelligence, socially incompetent, unskilled or unemployed, minimal use of restraints and leaves body on display. Victim is likely to be random, and the offender is messy and makes no effort to conceal incriminating evidence. Now, one thing that I do want to make a point of is the fact that we've got these ones in the middle, almost straddling the fence, isn't a bad thing. Because as we go on to evaluate the top-down approach, researchers have actually said you can't have separate categories for an organised offender and a disorganised offender. Because an organised offender could have attributes of a disorganised one. Therefore, psychologists say that they are on a continuum. And you can have it going from disorganised to organised. And essentially, you may get a criminal who on that scale is here. So they are more organised than disorganised. It doesn't mean that they haven't got disorganised attributes. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. yeah? There was a researcher which I put on the PowerPoint. He suggested that we have a mixed offender category. So again, if I was to draw it in a diagram format, we have this shaded area. It's mixed. We've got organised, disorganised, and then we've got the mixed category where we can dump anyone who doesn't quite fit into our, our norms. But that's a problem, because as a profiler, you want to have a clear view of who the potential suspect is. And the fear is, if you have this mixed category, you're just going to dump everyone in it, because no one may fit the actual set categories. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah. So that is stage three. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you guys the textbook handout. And what I need you all to do, I need you to summarize stages four, five, and six in a sentence. So in terms of how we evaluate this top-down approach, which is why we use the FBI, US police and systems, this guy called Coxon, very easy to remember his name, Coxon. Nobody's laughing. Cop. Yeah, yeah. Cop. Cop. Coxon. Like a police officer. Like a police officer. Like a police officer. So Coxon conducted a survey and his survey was on only 184 US police officers. Now, who can tell me how many states there are in the US? 52. 52. 52 states. We have 184 US police officers. Not from various states, just from one state. So already just be thinking red flag evaluation point. It's done in the US. But that aside, he actually found that 82% of police officers said that the technique was useful. 82% said it's useful. 
90% said that they would use this top-down approach again. So that's the study. I want to hear from you guys. What evaluation points are immediately coming to mind based on this questionnaire done by Copson? His sample doesn't seem representative. His sample doesn't seem representative. And it's too small. It's too small. Can we give some sort of, how can you elaborate on those points? So the sample's not representative, it's too small. So in an exam, you've made your point, explain it. Not representative, what does that mean? It's not like a uh, fair representation of his whole Yeah. Larry, are you going to add to it? Um, I was going to say that he lacks what is it population. Validity. Exactly. So if we were to take the results of Coxon's study and bring it to the UK, because it was done in the US on only 184 US police officers, how then can we apply the same results to the UK? How can we ex ex expect the same results in the UK? We can't, because it's a different demographic, number one. Even when we, we're not even talking about cross-country population, each state in America has their own governing system. The, a state is like a country. So the 184 US police officers, they may think that the top-down approach is good in their state, but in another state it may not work. So we've got an issue of population validity. Other evaluation points could you think about? Um, you can see that the results might, might be, um, they might not be right. When you're giving a survey about people like that, you're not really going to say no, you're just going to long explain why it's not useful. Yeah, so they might actually be biased, they might give biased answers in their response to the survey, perhaps because it was their superior who suggested that they use a top down approach and they dare not go against it. There's something like that. Yes, it's so in terms of when this questionnaire was given, and that's a very, very valid quote, we can see it was done in 1995. We are now in 2016. I was two years old when this study was done. So you can see that it's quite outdated. Now where we've got technology, we're more likely to actually use our data and go up to the profiler. Yeah? And then I want you guys, when you do come across studies like this and they present percentages to you, actually unpack the percentages. If 90% said that they would use it again, that means that 10% said they're not interested in using it again. It doesn't matter. Therefore, why? There's, there hasn't been any research into asking these, that 10%, why don't you want to use it again? How can we improve it? So that's a problem. And then again, 82% said that the technique was useful, but it means that the other percentage said no, it's not useful, it's not worth it. Does that make sense? 